and welcome to Men of the Word, a ministry of Calvary Chapel Heartland, just a couple miles west of I-75 on Highway 96 uh, out in the Pecan Grove. And I'm glad you could join us this morning. We meet in person live every Tuesday at Chick-fil-A there on Watson Boulevard in Warner Robins. Um, And this morning we're going to begin in Acts chapter 25. But before we do, we're going to read the last verse of chapter 24 that says, But after two days... Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So to kind of set up chapter 25, remember Paul had gone before Felix, and Felix uh, couldn't make a decision on what to do with Paul. So he kept him there in the praetorium, and uh, now it's been two years between chapter 24 and chapter 25. So we begin in verse 1 of chapter 25. It says, Now when Festus had come to the province after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul. And they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. So They're asking Festus to bring Paul to Jerusalem. They didn't reveal at that time that they were going to lay in ambush for him, but that was what was in their mind. So scripture here is telling us that this was their plan, to bring Paul to to Jerusalem so they could ambush him. Uh, Verse 4 says, But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. So the way the law worked then is you had to face your accusers. Your accusers had to come and there had to be more than two witnesses accusing you of the wrongful doing that you were supposed to have done. And so what Festus is doing is setting up another trial. And verse 6 says, and when he remained among them, More than ten days he went down to Caesarea, and the next day sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. And when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. Remember this first started the disruption in the temple when Paul was there for purification, and these Jews from Asia had followed Paul and started making these accusations against him that he brought Gentiles into the temple where they were not supposed to be. And so here in verse 7, this is the Jews that live in Jerusalem bringing these claims, and they couldn't prove it. They could not prove the things they were accusing Paul of. In verse 8, it says, Why he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, Have I offended in anything at all? So Paul makes this defense. You know, they're making false accusations. They can't prove anything. And I haven't done anything at all against the Jews or against the Romans. Verse 9 says, But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Festus, he didn't really understand the ways of the Jews, but he wanted to do the Jews a favor because they were under his, his region that he was over. And in doing them a favor, it would bring peace and he wouldn't have to um, do things he didn't want to. So what he's trying to do is find middle ground where he can bring Paul back down to Jerusalem, have another hearing, and let the Jews come against him. But remember... He had already invited the Jews to bring whoever they needed to up down to Caesarea from Jerusalem. And they brought those men and everything they said they couldn't prove. So verse 10 says, Then Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For I am an offen- if I am an offender or have committed anything Worthy of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which the men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. 
I appeal to Caesar. So Paul, remember Paul is a Roman citizen, and as such he has this right to appeal to Caesar. And if he appeals to Caesar, then it is Festus' job to make that happen. Verse 12 says, Then Festus, when he conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. Now, before we go too much farther, this King Agrippa is Agrippa II. And he is his great grandfather was the Herod who ordered the death of innocent children when Jesus was born. Remember, he ordered the male children under two years of age in the city of Bethlehem to be put to death. His great uncle Herod ordered the death, the beheading of John the Baptist. And his father, Herod Agrippa I, ordered the death of James that we studied just a few weeks ago where James was slain by a sword. This is Agrippa II, and his wife Bernice, and this is where it gets twisted, is also his sister. She is the daughter of Herod Agrippa I, and she is the sister of Drusilla, who was the wife of Felix. So it's kind of messed up. You see their kingly line is kind of twisted. And also note that this Herod Agrippa II He's very young, so he was given a kind of a remote province to be the king over so he could kind of learn how to be the king in the ways of of the Roman government. And also uh, notice every time we read Agrippa, most of the time we have Bernice is right there by his side, so they're always found together. And so let's see what happens. Verse 13 says, After some days... King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner about whom the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has the opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charges against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, <coughs> excuse me, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about one, Jesus, who died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And now because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed, appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. Now keep in mind, since Paul has appealed to go to Caesar to have his trial, that this appearing before King Agrippa is not actually a trial. It's just more of a hearing where Paul gets the opportunity to present his case before King Agrippa, though it has no standing as far as him being bound. Verse 23, so the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with, present with us. <laughs> you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appeared to Augustus, I decided to send him. 
He says he decided to send him, but actually as a Roman citizen, once Paul made that plea, it wasn't up to him. He had no decision in the matter. Once a Roman citizen appeals to Caesar, he has to go before Caesar. Verse 26 says, I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. Again, he had no choice to send him, but here he doesn't have an actual charge that's a, that would have standing in the Roman government in order to send Paul. He can't say Paul did this again in violation to the Roman government. Paul did that in violation to Roman law. He really didn't have anything to say. And he knew that Agrippa had a background with the Jews. He had a Jewish background. He understood the mindset of the Jews, of the Old Testament scriptures, and why they would be offended by what Paul was saying. So verse 1 in chapter 26 says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was sent, spent from the beginning among my own nation in Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They know me from the first, if they are willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of the religion, I live a Pharisee. To this promise, our, it says, verse 6, I'm sorry, I skipped one. And now I stand judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. So that's important. Paul is saying he lived according to the strictest sect of their laws as a Jew there in Jerusalem. And all of these Jews knew Paul. They knew him. They knew how he lived. And what he's saying in verse 6 is that he's judged because the hope that the Old Testament prophets and Old Testament scripture that prophesied about the coming Messiah, all he's doing is, is saying, look, all I did was present the completed prophecy of the Old Testament scriptures because that is exactly what Jesus is. He is the fulfillment of all scripture and all prophecy in his coming. Then verse 7 it says, To this promise our twelve tribes earnestly serve in God day and night hope to attain. They hope to see this Messiah. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, in verse 10 says, This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Paul is saying he was doing the same thing these very Jews are doing to him. He was against the Christians because he did not yet understand. He did not yet comprehend that Jesus was in fact the Messiah that Jesus Christ was in fact the Christ, that he died on the cross for his sins, that he was resurrected the third day. He didn't understand or comprehend any of that as it related to the Old Testament promise, the Old Testament prophecy, the Old Testament scriptures that pointed directly to Jesus the Messiah. Then verse 12 says, While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission of the chief priests at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining 
around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of these things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among the people who are sanctified by faith in me or set apart by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So Paul lays it out perfectly, explaining his salvation experience and the purpose behind it and who Jesus is and exactly what he's being accused of. Verse 20 says, But I declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works benefiting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having attained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both the small and great, and saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. See, he's just pointing to them to prophecy fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that the Christ would suffer that he would be the first to rise up from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. What an amazing testimony. Then verse 24, it says, Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning has made you mad. But Paul said, he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak the words of truth and reason. So you remember Festus, he didn't have that Jewish background. He didn't understand the ways of the Jews. And so what Paul was saying really probably didn't make sense to him a whole lot. And he's thinking Paul is crazy. And then verse 26, it says, For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. That is, he understands what I'm saying. For I am not convinced, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. That is, Jesus being crucified and resurrected, it wasn't hidden. Everybody knew about it. Verse 27 King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, and this is the sat one of the saddest verses in all of scripture. You almost persuaded me to become a Christian. That is, you almost persuaded me to believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. What a sad verse. When someone having heard the gospel turns away and makes a conscious decision not to accept Jesus. Then verse 29, and Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So Paul's saying, I wish all of you would come to know Jesus Christ. Remember, he's the one on trial. Even though this wasn't a, a necessarily a trial, but a hearing. He's the one that is the spectacle of this whole thing they have going on, this pomp and this circumstance where they bring all these wealthy people together, all the rulers of their time, and they bring them in this arena, and Paul is the focus. But Paul, his desire is not for himself. It's for those people who are hearing his testimony to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Then verse 30, when he had said these things, the king stood up, 
as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing worthy of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So Agrippa is kind of making this comment that if, if Paul had not appealed to Caesar, then they would possibly have let him go. But remember, Paul, he's headed to Rome. He's headed to Rome to be a testimony before Caesar. So I don't know that they could have changed that. I don't know they could have misdirected it. If he hadn't appealed to Caesar, would he have gone back to Jerusalem before he met Agrippa? We don't know those things. Uh, but we do know that their opinion was that it could have, could have come out had a different ending. Uh, but Paul, remember, Paul said he's, worth, he's ready to die. He said if he's done anything worthy of guilt, worthy of punishment, he is ready to die. I do not object to dying, he said. But he's ready. He'd finish his course. He'd run the race. And he'd been a witness to all of these people. And so that's encouragement to us that we should continue, continue to point people to Jesus Christ in our lives, in our daily conversation. And <clears throat> as we do that, we will see lives change. But not everyone, just like King Agrippa, is going to accept the testimony of the gospel. And so with that, we'll pick up in chapter 27 next week. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the time that we have to study. Thank you that your Holy Spirit, as we study, Lord, speaks to us, points us, directs us, changes our hearts, changes our mind, and shows us the truth that is revealed through your word. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that everyone who watches this knows you as their Lord and Savior. But if not, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, we live in such a confusing and frustrating time, Lord. We need your word. We need your truth, Lord, to keep us on the right path, to keep our feet planted. And Lord, as we walk in you, Lord, help us to be the light that shines before men, drawing them unto you. Lord, for all of that, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.